Hi, and welcome to the procurement channel for Sapphire Now Converge. I'm Alexis Glick. In all my years as a television journalist and executive, I never thought the term supply chain disruption would make the evening news. But never say never. These are interesting times to be sure, but times like these require action. And today we'll see how customers are responding to unprecedented change with SAP Ariba, SAP Field Glass, and SAP S4 HANA. Together, we'll reimagine the future of procurement, guided by SAP procurement solution leaders, including President Chris Hayden, Chief Product Officer Salva Lombardo, and Head of Product Strategy, Babur Farouk. Before we begin, let's take a moment to recognize the new heroes emerging around us every day. These people aren't star athletes and they don't have special powers. They are everyday people. They are you. So let's celebrate you. We live in a highly complex world. Strategically navigating through constant changes and relentless forces is now the norm. Transforming challenges into opportunities takes serious focus and determination. It releases the real power within you. You are the heroes, the agents of change, making things happen, balancing growth with responsibility, making it real. Here's to you, the connectors, bringing together the right partners, building bridges, and unlocking insights. And you, the aces, you have that keen strategic eye to make the decisions today that skyrocket your business tomorrow. The icons, you bring leadership and expertise to influence what happens next. And you, the idols, breaking down barriers, reinventing processes, and redefining your role. Here's to all of you, the change makers, pioneers, legends. You protect the enterprise while maintaining a focus on growth, making it real. We celebrate you and cannot wait for what lies ahead, today and tomorrow. Real impact, real value, real results. Intelligent spend solutions from SAP. These are some encouraging and powerful possibilities. Just a few ways to reimagine your business, especially when times are so uncertain. We all know too well how disruption has become a part of doing business and the demands on you have never been greater. Today, organizations need to be prepared at a moment's notice to coordinate and manage supplies, suppliers, and talent, and rapidly implement cost controls, all while reconnecting a supply chain with dozens, hundreds, or thousands of broken links at a pace and scale we've never seen before. Fortunately, we're seeing amazing collaboration across borders and industries to help our world respond and heal. And collaboration is what procurement does best. Here's an example of that teamwork in action. Once again, another incredible story, finding suppliers when companies need them most. And now I'm so excited to be joined by Chris Hayden. He is the president of SAP Procurement Solutions, and he's a man who knows an awful lot about supply chains. Chris, it's great to have you. Thanks, Alexis, and it's great to meet you and being part of Sapphire now. Uh, you know, awesome experience for us. We just ran a digital event a couple of months ago, Reba Live. 
And we know how empowering and how valuable these digital events can be. Well, we're so excited to jump right in. And, you know, look, we know the procurement and supply chain have always played a critical role in the economy, but right now they are truly front and center. Uh, and there's just this new visibility around the importance of the supply chain. Give us a sense from your perspective, what you've witnessed over the past 12 weeks. How do you believe we can learn from this moment in time and what gets you most excited? Sure. Well, look, Number one is proud, proud to be part of the procurement and supply chain community to see how they've responded to support industries and to support companies. And we've seen some of the great responses there, whether it be in healthcare um, or in government or anywhere in between. What can we learn? Well, simply we can learn a couple of things that, you know, agileness, the ability to partner and the marrying of the people supply chain with the digital supply chain. How do we great take this expertise that resides in the head of these procurement professionals and link them together digitally with the great new technologies that SAP is bringing to bear to really drive these differential and agile outcomes? So I, I think about you and, you know, stepping into this role on March 1st to become the leader of SAP Procurement Solutions right as this pandemic hit. And, you know, given the environment, what is your vision and how has your vision in any way, shape or form shifted as a result of what we've just witnessed? Yeah, thanks, Alex. I have to admit a little bit of a hijack. It kind of wasn't in the plans, but I think that's the reality for everyone, right? Uh, we all had great plans for relatively the new year. And then, bang, here we, here we are. Now, what has it done for the vision? I think if anything else, it's accelerated our belief in the business network. How interconnected we are with our buyers, our suppliers, our other trading partners, our governments. You know, when you look at it, it just manifests itself when we go down to the, uh, to the shopping center, see our retail stores empty, right? What does that mean and how do we be responsive and how do we be resilient in what we thought were secure supply chains? And clearly they're not. So what, given what you have seen, inspires you the most on a day-to-day -day basis? What inspires me really is, again, how people have been willing to step up and take a, like what I call a day zero mentality, stealing from Jeff Bezos there, right? That startup mentality in these supply chains have been around for whatever, 20, 30, 50, 100, whatever years. And think about how they have to refactor, rebuild them on the fly. And thinking about the human dynamic of that and not just the technology dynamic, because I think it's the intersection of those two where we've really seen some breakthrough thinking. And that's, that's the really exciting thing for me. So when we go back to whatever the normal is or the new normal, how do we ensure that the degree of visibility right now around procurement and supply chains remains as integral as it is today in the months and years ahead? You know, good question. How do we do that? Well, I think number one is we've had a fundamental mind share shift that we understand how impactful, right, procurement really is to business. And just a very quick metaphor. In, in procurement world, we have this notion of direct materials, right, or direct services. These are the most critical supplies to underpin your business and your customers. Well, guess what we found? We found that indirect materials, perhaps like masks, actually are just as important <laughs> in the supply chain and the continuity of the service or the good than ever before. And so I think it's this understanding of these new areas, these new bottlenecks, this risk that's actually always been, has now been manifest. And so now with the people and now with the technology, we need to shine light on that and be able to respond on that like never before. So in closing, if you were to summarize what it is right now that you see around the innovation, around the pipeline, and in working with your customers that gets you most excited about the future, what might that be? Look, it's clearly about the business networks, right? How do we match demand with supply? How do we optimize the order to cash and the source to settle process across and among all the trading partners across the industries? I mean, SAP has amazing technology and amazing people to help our customers do that. And I think the world and the economy is really ready to optimize all these business processes that have been, you know, candidly 
locked in their own silos and we need to smash them open. And that's what I'm really excited about. Well, you get us excited too. Chris, I can't thank you enough. I know you've been on the hot seat in a very short period of time. Your insights are incredibly valuable and we're really happy to see the supply chain come front and center at such a critical time in our nation's history. Thanks, Alexis. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Thanks, Chris. Great chatting with you. Thank you for sharing an inspiring vision of the possibilities for procurement. Now we have the pleasure of hearing from a company that is helping us stay connected. For that, I want to introduce Aditi Singh, Director of Advocacy in the SAP Procurement Solutions area. Aditi? Thank you, Alexis, and thank you, Ninian, for being here today. We're so excited to have you here to share your journey and Vodafone's procurement journey. As you know, we consider Vodafone one of the leading adopters in the intelligent enterprise space. Can you tell us a little bit about how that journey began, where you are today, and what's coming next? Thank you very much, first of all, for the opportunity to come in and uh, speak with yourselves. It's, it's great for Vodafone to have this opportunity. Our journey uh, to become more of an intelligent enterprise started about four and a half to five years ago, uh, basically around a lot of frustration, which I had personally around the way we worked within supply chain management and the way we reported our performance in supply chain management, which was very undigital at the time. And since then, we created our own vision about where we wanted to take the function to be the best supply chain uh, organization in the world, digitally connected, and really supporting this enhanced relationship with our partners and suppliers. Within Vodafone, we're spending something like 25 billion euros per annum with 11,000 partners. And digitizing all of those relationships is critically important to us. And within the organization, we have, uh, I think, implemented nearly everything that uh, SAP have as a product, whether it's from our expenses claiming with Concur, Flexforce, Ariba, SAP for HANA. We've been on an extraordinary journey over the last 18 to 24 months, and it's been really successful. In fact, I would say that the rollout of the capabilities with SAP, our partners, probably been most, one of the most successful transformation journeys which we've had in Vodafone. Thank you, Ninian, for sharing that. You know, you mentioned one of your goals to become a supply chain management company, and at that, one of the best in the world. And it really brought me to the next subject, which has to do with supply chain and intelligent enterprises. As we think about intelligent enterprises, we often refer to the ability to tap into strong networks. Today, more than ever, we're seeing just how interconnected the world is and how important these networks are in being able to deal with and handle supply chain disruption. Given that a majority of your supply base is enabled on the Ariba network, how has that technology enabled you to deal with these challenges that we're seeing today? I think it's a great question and I think, you know, we're all living through completely unprecedented times uh, and I think the ability to connect digitally to your supply base, to reach out to your suppliers using the network allows us and has allowed us over the last six months to have continuity of supply uh, to make sure that we keep our customers uh, fully fulfilled in terms of the services we provide to them. And so far, we've had almost no glitches in the service which we provide. And it's really so important now, supply chain within our organization, helping manage risk for the business and helping ensure that we have the right suppliers who can then, as we always say in supply chain, get the right products at the right times, the right place. And we use the network to support us every single day uh, with every single one of our supplier partners. Thank you, Ninian, for sharing that. Incredibly inspiring to see that your strategy, despite adversity, will still remain resilient. With that, we have, I think, time for one more question, and it's a little moment to pause and reflect on the future. Today, we see that procurement leaders of the future are dealing with the global pandemic for the first time ever. It can be incredibly overwhelming, but we also know that there's lessons to be learned. And I'd like to know what your advice would be for someone like me, that's the next generation of procurement leaders, in how we'd adapt and manage in times of change, in the future and today. I think it's a great question. And for sure, it's different. I was sort of 
one of the people who just wanted to be in the office I, I didn't like working from home. And, and now we're sort of entering week 12 here of sort of lockdown in Luxembourg. So you have to learn new skills, uh, new capabilities to help you keep connected uh, with your team, with your supplier partners, and, and also acknowledging that sometimes it's, it's good just to make a phone call and not just have video sessions all the time. But the key skill I would impress on, on everybody is, first of all, keep connected to your team. Keep the communication lines open with your team. Don't assume that they're okay just because you're okay. You know, everybody comes at this situation from a different perspective. And then the second thing I would say to all of my peer group, all of my colleagues, if you're, if you're, and, and new people are coming in the function, think digital day one. You know, the digital pace is going to significantly accelerate over the next few years because you know what? We've proved we can run our procurement function in Vodafone from home. You know, we have 408 colleagues who work in the Luxembourg office, nearly a thousand in supply chain, nearly a hundred thousand in the company. And we're running, you know, the second biggest mobile company in the world from home. And we can only do that because of the digital tools which we've already implemented. If we couldn't do contract signature dig digitally, we would not be able to do it. If we couldn't do purchase order processing digitally, we wouldn't be able to do it. If we couldn't do invoice processing digitally, we wouldn't be able to do it. Now, at the moment, we don't have to do many expenses on current car, but we've got that digital process as well. So everybody talks about digitalize or, or die, and, but I really think people talk also about digital first strategies. Don't have a digital first strategy. Have a digital only strategy. And this will give your people real flexibility in where they want to work in the future because some people might choose not to go back to the office and you want to keep as connected with them as you keep connected with your supply base. Incredibly insightful, Ninian. I love moving from a digital first mindset into the digital only. Um, I think those are really impactful words to end our session with. Thank you again for being here. Congratulations on the journey that you've taken so far. Best of luck in all future endeavors. And thank you for your partnership with SAP. With that, I'll turn it back over to Alexis. Thanks. Thanks, Aditi. And now we get the inside story, the partner perspective from EY, one of the world's largest professional services firms. Now we'll hear from EY's Andres Leguizaman and Hamish McKechnie Sharma as they share how EY's total spend management strategy powered by SAP can help organizations build resiliency throughout supply chain and procurement operations. Hi, thanks for joining us today. I'm Andy McGuire with SAP's Global Partner Organization. And speaking with me are Hamish McKechnie Sharma and Andres Leguizaman, both from EY. Hamish, in the current environment, we're all seeing the need for resilience and rapid transformation to keep up with the pace of change. Does total spend management play a role in increasing an organization's resiliency? Yes, it does. And there are two key reasons for this. Total spend management is not just about a procurement problem. It also fuels data and analytics to the board, important information to make key decisions. Secondly, fuels insights from a finance transformation perspective and thirdly, increase the supply chain management and supplier risk visibility off the backdrop of a widely distributed supply chain. The other big factor is what I call getting back to basics. So here it's very much about making sure in, this, in the COVID scenario we're in, keeping your house in order, making sure that something as simple as a source to payment process is clear, visible, we have clear buying channels across Ariba, Concur and Fieldglass paramount to visibility, control and efficiency, and ensuring we can do supply substitution and business resilience easily and effectively. And Andres, you're speaking with clients a good bit. What trends are you seeing in the market and how can total spend management help address them? Certainly, Andy, uh, we see uh, that many clients were not exactly ready for uh, the events of the last couple of months um, in terms of disruption to their operations, uh, the challenges in supply chain, at this point that we're seeing uh, a really a significant focus on liquidity and on, on profitable growth, on really stabilizing the business. 
And they're realizing that together, they need a visibility that they might not have today. Where tools for management can help is by unlocking the value of some of the data that's in some of the Spain applications and bringing it into insights that can really be used to make the right decisions. A very important point too is the element of knowing your supplier, which is really what enables an organization to understand all the drivers around supply risk, um, around supply chain disruptions and to optimize cost. Okay, and, and to wrap things up, given those market trends and the impact to the spend management space, what unique value proposition does the EY and SAP collaboration represent to current and potential clients? Absolutely, Andy. So we've been working on, on this notion for some time and we feel very strong about the value it can provide for clients through a combination of the strong uh, capabilities of the SAP platform through S4 and the Spain applications, combined with EY's global capability and experience with complex clients, providing advices on advice on elements like the financial supply chain um, around analytics and tax to make sure that there are business outcomes that the client can in fact get out of the process. I'd agree with Andreas. EY and SAP can create both a tactical and strategic impact to our clients, whether that's simple health checks across spend categories or functions, or full-scale total spend management deployments, underpinned by an S4 core with finance, Ariba, Concur, and Fieldglass. Our practitioners are skilled in industries and nuances of process and technology. I mean, one example of this is a large European bank where we focused on surfacing greater spend visibility and contract compliance through the introduction of SAP Ariba. What's clear for me is that the value of total spend management cannot be done by technology alone, nor can it be performed without technology. Thanks, guys, for speaking with me today and for your partnership. And please stay safe and healthy. Welcome back. In a moment, we're going to speak to Salva Lombardo, Chief Product Officer of SAP Procurement Solutions. But first, let's hear about how Deloitte reimagined procurement. Deloitte is a global professional services firm which offers services in audit, tax, consulting, and risk advisory. We have a vision set out for 2020, and part of achieving that global vision is to become a truly global enterprise. First part of the, the buying equation was we need to use our strategic suppliers. The second part was um, actually we needed to introduce this concept of authorization before commitment. The solutions that we're putting in place like S4 HANA and Ariba are creating a digital core for our business from which we can expand our digital offerings. $1.3 trillion in spend going through that platform. We're only just beginning to understand the, the power and the potential of the Ariba network. Hello, and thank you for joining this session on the next generation of SAP procurement. I'm Salvatore Lombardo, and since March this year, the Chief Product Officer for SAP procurement. As such, I'm responsible for the direction of our SAP Source to Bay products and ensuring that our procurement offerings, including the business network, help you meet the challenges of the changing world. Over the past few months, the world has been transforming significantly. 
we observed even more how closely connected the world, our business and uh, processes have become. Procurement and the complete supply chain have rapidly moved back to center stage of leaders' focus. Over the last few months or weeks, I have spoken to many customers who are facing accelerated or new challenges in the area of sustainability of their procurement value chains, especially during COVID-19. Now, more than ever, integrated business processes across source to pay can help to master the new normal. In this context, the SAP procurement product organization is even more laser focused on developing our solutions with integrated business processes at the center of our strategy. With the clear goal of helping our customers stay, stay resilient against changing market conditions. For all of the key pillars of the SAP source to pay process, we are pursuing a crystal clear product monster as essential part of the SAP intelligent enterprise suite. This means that we are creating an holistic product strategy which drives business value and is supported by a technology North Star architecture. This product North Star covers the existing SAP procurement capabilities and drives our future product roadmaps and technology requirements. Let me focus today on three areas as examples of how we drive product design towards an intelligent procurement suite. We will talk about invoice management, supplier management, and our core operational procurement offerings and share updates which are happening right now. To start with, the first product area, I want to briefly focus on invoice management. We aim to create a holistic end-to-end -end process from order to cash to source to pay. This means from the invoice creation with contractual input to the receipt and validation and to the highest degree of automatic approvals for all spent invoices in one platform. With the support of country-specific localized invoice management based on our SAP business network capabilities and the SAP cloud platform. Just to mention a few benefits. We will have standard integration with SAP ERP backends like SAP s SAP ECC and the business network via agnostic APIs which partners can con consume too. Customers will get workflows for invoice approval, which will be configurable, providing flexibility in addressing specific business needs. Furthermore, invoice data verification and enrichment using artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies will reduce manual process steps to a minimum. Finally, customers will leverage an open and extensible platform powered by a partner ecosystem, for instance, in the areas of tax, logistics, risk, and fraud detection. Next up is a foretaste into our product, Nordstar for supplier management. Naturally, we keep the supplier in mind and not just the buyer, and we want to support both direct and indirect procurement with a strong emphasis on direct. The goal is to build a framework that allows a user or partner to configure the app the way they want, focusing on the buyer and seller side persona. Let me give you a few examples on how we want to do this. But let's keep in mind that we are talking about a North Star, which will be delivered incrementally. We want to deliver supplier value by adopting a supplier portal and new supplier experience for supplier management, including mobile and data-driven insights. We want to implement a central solution for the integration of supplier data in all source to pay business processes and apps for reusable assets like risk, performance, and category management. The next evolutionary generation of supplier management will be built on a common master data domain model concept, which spans across the customer landscape and the IP design to ensure the principle of one supplier object across the system. At the same time, we will introduce a trading partner management solution to reflect the complexity of our customer environments for all partners in the all spent process world. We will deliver one end-to-end -end integrated platform across all our operational spend engines and buying solutions with the goal of one operational spend and buying solution unification. We will accomplish this by evolving our existing solutions to a unified, modular, and open platform. With that, we are addressing all spend categories, including indirect, services, contingent workforce, MRE, and direct. 
The aim is to always focus on unique needs of specific buying personas, providing intelligence and insights at the point of need. This means a persona-centric buying experience with guidance and built-in intelligence covering all spend channels. This provides buyers throughout the organization with the necessary tools and capabilities to support their specific needs. It also enables the purchasing department and professional buyers to ensure necessary compliance and control along the full end-to-end -end process. And with necessary insights and capabilities to execute the purchasing strategy. It becomes possible to guide user and demands to the right spend channel. Of course, all of this is based on our SAP Intelligent Enterprise Suite strategy and SAP's cloud platform. You see very exciting times ahead of us in the SAP procurement space. Let me summarize the way forward for SAP procurement from a product perspective. We are working with a renewed and powerful focus on an end-to-end -end integration delivering along the intelligent enterprise suite. It will enable innovations for all customers, existing and new ones, by creating incrementally the next generation of SAP procurement. This means that we deliver more and more integration content and new evolutionary product capabilities out of the box to give you the scalability and flexibility and intelligence across the entire suite. By keeping your business running and make you successful and ready for the upcoming digital future. We will soon share more updates beyond the three focus areas introduced today. And we will share more insights how the North Star are translated into concrete roadmaps. Next, you will hear from a SAP customer, OMB, and our system integrator partner, Absolute, about how their need for speed, transparency, and end-to-end -end platform led them to use SAP's intelligent enterprise suite offering, and how they were able to achieve immediate business benefits in a phased approach. I very much look forward to helping you in your transformation with our SAP procurement capabilities. So thanks for being with me, and I hope to talk to you soon. Ciao. Hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Robert Fessler. I'm the head of the Intelligent Spend Group for Central Eastern Europe at SAP. And I'm joined today by Thomas Herbst, Managing Director of Absolut, and Martin Draxel, Head of Strategy and Digitalization at Corporate Procurement at OMV. OMV is one of the biggest Austrian companies. They produce and market oil and gas, innovative energies, and high-end petrochemical solutions. Everything very responsibly. Martin, why don't you tell us a little bit on why OMV started on that transformational digital journey? Thank you, Robert. Digitalization, of course, does not only change what we source and what we buy, which corporations models we use, but it's a great opportunity for procurement as a function to drive efficiency and effectiveness. And this is why at OMV, our CPO Klaus Blachnik started an ambitious and holistic procurement transformation program. He made digitalization a top priority for us. It's, it's key to achieve value-creating procurement. Hey, thanks a lot for sharing your insights, Martin. Thomas, what were the main reasons for OMV to choose a, a hybrid SAP scenario going for SAP S4HANA and SAP Ariba? So, thank you, Robert, for that really good question. So, with the new digitalization journey of OMV, the trend to go for a cloud solution and also the cost-saving program, we started early 2018 with the analysis of the SE situation and also building the future architecture. So the S4HANA central procurement provides a central platform and layer for the purchasers with a tight integration to their multiple ERP systems. And with the SAP Ariba platform, we established a single platform for suppliers for onboarding, electronic document exchange, sourcing and contract management. Standardization and user friendliness are the main drivers of the program and the reasons deciding for SAP Ariba and central procurement. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, Thomas, end to end. So, Martin, what, what are the main benefits that you're now experiencing by digitalizing the procurement process end to end? 
Yeah, I believe in the current COVID crisis, we clearly see the value of a digitalized uh, procurement process and the benefits out of it. Because I think we have two main objectives to fulfill at the moment. First, it's avoiding business disruption and ensure business continuity. And the second one is our core discipline, we have to substantially contribute to cost optimization and safeguard the financial strengths of our group. And it seems like you were prepared very well for the current crisis. Hey, hey guys, what do you think are the most important success factors, the most important you know, critical factors to make, make such a digitalization project successful? Martin, maybe we start with you. Yeah, unfortunately, there is no secret ingredient for success in such programs. To implement such fast-paced projects, you need a strong team. You need a strong team on OMV side, on implementation partner side, and on SCP side. We were very happy that we had such a strong team, and this is why we were able to implement our Lighthouse project for strategic sorting within three months only. Big thanks to SCP and also to your team, Thomas, uh, who made this possible. So. Um, maybe you would like to add some key success factors from your side. Yeah, thanks, Martin, for, for asking me. So from our perspective, it's mandatory to have an implementation partner with strong knowledge, flexibility, and the spirit in the team. Also, deep technical and functional knowledge to support such a transformation. We supported the uh, OMV from the early beginning of the program, including architecture and process design, the user stories, a functional setup, and for sure the technical integration and at the end testing, training and the rollouts of the program. Okay, I really like this, you know, looking at it end to end, but still have a first success with sourcing going live in three months. Martin, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your experience on the OMV Digital Transformational Project. And with that, Alexis, back to you. Wow, this sounds really exciting. The future of procurement looks bright. In this age of change, our customers provide great inspiration for best practices and reimagining a better tomorrow. Here are a few of their stories. The goals were simple, the savings number. We set up a time frame of five years and it took us a little bit less than three years to achieve. It was Fascinating. Everybody was extremely happy. The best thing about our SAP Ariba experience really is the people, the excellent professionals that we work with. When it comes down to doing business and actually putting projects into place and making our customers happy, it's about the people that we work with. I'm very proud using Ariba to change the culture of our process, of our uh, people, of our suppliers as well. Now we are thinking about some other layers, some other functions that we wanted to adapt more of the technology into our process. We have the ERP of SAP, so I think uh, at one point of time I'm looking at 100% automation. It is part of our e-commerce strategy to be where our customers are and to make sure that we support our customers' processes and that includes, of course, the buying processes. So that's why Ariba is important to us as a platform or as a network. Being on SAP Ariba, this is a very much sustainable e-commerce solution which is helping us to keep our back office operations cost at bay. And this is effectively helping us to bring success stories to our customer in terms of real-time ordering experience and timely shipment and deliveries. We really wanted the end-to-end -end experience and that was one of the things that worked in Nariba's favour when we were choosing a technology. We've already got 98% adoption rate within some of our core operational areas and we're continuing the rollout to faculty. So the adoption that we've seen has just been tremendous.
And now a word from our partners at Salonis. Hi, everybody. This is Sean Thompson. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Network and Ecosystem Business within the SAP Procurement Solution area. I'm thrilled to welcome a good friend of mine, currently the Chief Innovation Officer at Salonis and formerly the Chief Procurement Officer at SAP. Welcome, Marcel. Thanks, Sean. It's great seeing you. And welcome also for my side. Thanks for having me. Marcel, SAP and Salonis enjoy a very strategic relationship. Can you tell the audience a little bit about Salonis? Absolutely. Salonis is a market leader for process mining, process analytics technology. And we have artificial intelligence powered solutions to help companies really to drive process performance and focus on business outcomes. That's what we are doing with more than 700 customers in the meantime. And we're very happy to be one component helping customers really to drive effectively the digital transformation. Terrific, Marcel. Now, within the procurement area, specifically where Ariba plays, can you tell us a little bit about the role that Salonis can play for the procurement organization? Ariba is market leader for cloud solutions in procurement, and we are very close solution extension partner. So basically we are considered as an extension of the solutions what SAP, SAP Ariba has. And therefore we have a defined set for procure to pay solutions where we help companies really to drive everything what is related to the procurement process that procurement can focus on what really counts. And I was the chief procurement officer by myself, leverage the procurement, power, the purchasing power, number one, and number two, to drive the automation to a much higher extent. And that's what we do. You know, Marcel, as a former chief procurement officer of SAP, you understand the value of customer stories. Can you give us a couple of examples of the value that customers have, have driven from the Salonis and Ariba integration? Absolutely. I think you need to have customer references. That's absolutely key. And I'm very happy to provide two examples from the telecommunication industry. Number one is Vodafone, a large telecommunication provider in, in Europe. They have around 5 million invoices on an annual basis, around 800,000 um, purchase orders. We could help them in a fairly short time frame that they could improve their purchase order quality from 73% up to 96%. I think this is a very good example also what you can do by improving the quality. And this brought them into the Hackett world-class ranking. Another one is Deutsche Telekom. And yeah, you might be not surprised. I'm a German. Um, you hear it from my accent. Sorry for that. But basically, um, they are processing around 9 million invoices and around 2 million um, purchase order line items. And we could help them that they could achieve and with the transparency, get additional 40 million on cash discounts, what they could realize by leveraging the, the process mining technology from Salonis. And that's what we did. And by the way, of course, both are using SAP Ariba as their core solution to run their P2P processes. It's amazing, Marcel. Thank you so much. It's a strategic relationship that we have. And for the audience to get to know more about Salonis, please reach out to your SAP account executive or customer engagement executive. Thank you again, Marcel. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks for having me. It was a great pleasure, Sean, as always. intelligent enterprise. It's a term you hear a lot about at SAP. What it does, among other things, is enable the rapid transformation of data into insight, leveraging emerging technologies so the workforce can focus on higher value outcomes. Essentially, it's changing business and the world for the better. Now let's take a look at our 2020 SAP Innovation Award winners.
congratulations to all our customers, both winners and finalists, who have taken on the transformation challenge. Coming up, we hear from Babur Farouk, the head of product strategy for SAP Procurement Solutions. Babur will give us a glimpse into the future of procurement. Hello everyone, thanks for joining me. My name is Babur Farooq and I'm the head of product strategy for SAP's procurement solutions. And I've been doing this role for about four months now. And it's very important in this role that I take, keep, a, keep an eye out on what's going on broadly speaking in the world and what might have an economic impact on the different regions and industries that SAP caters to so that we can ensure that you, our customers, um, can be can trust us in the investment that you're making and that your solution that you purchase from us is future proof. With respect to that, of course, there's a very significant once in a hundred year event with the global pandemic that's going on. But even if you ignored the pandemic for, for a minute, prior to the pandemic even, the world was going through a remarkable amount of change. We know that the global economy has been on a trend towards automation. It started with the rise of the internet in the early 2000s, and it's now really hitting peak with industry 4.0 and automotive intelligence and machine learning and artificial intelligence. You know, um, all these interesting trends that everyone is aware of. But what's, what's changed in the past 10 years or so is despite the fact that the investments in artificial intelligence and these technologies to increase productivity has increased, overall the economy has seen a flattening of productivity. We're not as productive as an economy now between 2010 and 2020 as we were between 2000 and 2010. And, and you know, what's interesting is to understand, well, wh why is that so? What's happening? And it's not so much that the benefits of automation are not there. It's that those benefits of automation are being concentrated in certain types of jobs and in certain types of industries. So it's with that backdrop that you have to look at how we have to assess the market and what are the products that we have to develop from a procurement perspective to end up giving the biggest bang for, to, you know, in terms of productivity gains and efficiency gains for our customers. Um, so, you know, procurement was already going through a big change as part of this, right? You know, we were already, of course, tasked with increased savings, something that's never going to change, it seems. But you also had a responsibility to now get to supply chain security, risk and reputational management it became a big part of procurement responsibilities. Um, you know, and, and then at the same time, we also had this obligation to empower end users um, to be able to make decisions themselves for procurement to get out of the way, but do so in a manner that was compliant. And then with this pandemic, you know, there are further challenges. Not only do you have to do more with less, but you also have to now see what parts of procurement you can automate right, given the demands and the pressure of the market, and what parts can be automated for the rest of the business, and procurement can bring those innovative suppliers to your business to help the overall procurement transfer, or the, the sort of automotive transformation, I should say, of your business holistically. Now, to discuss that more, I have today the head of business transformation from HCL, Gurpreet Singh. Gurpreet, thank you for joining us. The pleasure is all mine. So Gurpreet, why don't we start off by getting a background of HCL and their business and how you made the decision to set out on a procurement transformation with SAP. Okay, so uh, so HCL is uh, today in $9.94 billion revenue organization. So it's the next generation technology company serving customers across industries. We operate in 46 countries, uh, you know, with a strong and talented uh, idea preneurs of 150,000 plus. So as far as, uh, you know, my journey with the HCL on the tr transformation concerned, uh, I think we, we consider transformation as very simple, right? So whatever, uh, no matter a change, which is no matter a big, uh, relates to our systems, processes, policies, that make it completely aligned with the uh, front end objectives of the organization. I think we can call it as a transformation. Let me ask you, as I was saying earlier, we live in certainly the most unprecedented times of our generation. And the impact of COVID has, has been drastic on the global economy and, and HCL being a people business and being a business where there's obviously lots of travel involved as well, must certainly have been impacted also. How is HCL dealing with this, with this disruption and what role do you see procurement playing in helping navigate these uncertain times? 
Okay, so I think uh, it's a testing time for the businesses, right? Um, and these times makes true friends uh, along the customers. So as far as procurement is concerned, uh, you know, we, we already have invested into uh, this entire uh, platform, right? Uh, which is helping us to give us an integrated view of all our activities, be it a demand management, logistics management, internal authorization. So all is at one place. And moreover, we are able to now do some seamless connectivity with the vendor ecosystem. So this way, you know, the things goes digital uh, and you have more of such tools in place. So it helps us in, you know, uh, managing our work from homes, suppliers expectations, customer expectations in a, in a, in a better way. And, and, and so often, Gurpreet, when, when the um, global economy is disrupted by events that are unforeseen, uh, we have the ability to come out stronger. Um, and in that vein, you know, I think the hope is that we will all come out stronger as communities, as businesses, as enterprises, as we rebound from the economic crisis caused by COVID. So, so my question, you know, to you is, one part of coming back stronger means that you actually don't change some of the habits you were forced to change when you come back. So how do you see procurement evolving as a result of what we may have learned through the COVID crisis um, than, than, you know, from how we operated initially before the crisis? So, uh, of course, right, uh, there are certain things which uh, never changes, right? So uh, as far as the procurements and related transformations are concerned. So considering the procurement area, uh, today we talk about top three priorities, right? So one is, of course, the strategic purchase, where we are just aggregating our internal demands and customer demands in a, in a seamless way so that we talk strategic with the partners, right, and not moving away with the tactical and transaction-based purchases. Second, we are trying to make a very good balance between the speed and execution and controls and compliances, right? So that's very important. Third, I would strongly feel that seamless connectivity with the vendor ecosystem helps us provide that level of transparency, objective decision making, and it also gives a beautiful experience to our suppliers while dealing with us. So I think taken together, uh, SAP Ariba is helping us in meeting those objectives in a, in a very better way. And especially when, you know, the physical connect travel is down, uh, these things make a lot of difference in our uh, procurement journey. Thank you, Gurpreet. That's, that, that's really interesting. And, and one final question I have for you is, is with respect to the emerging economies of the world. HCL is obviously based in India. We're very proud of the business we have in Asia and in India and how we've been able to support um, businesses like HCL as that economy continues to grow. So my final question to you is, how do you see the world or the role of procurement changing in emerging economies uh, where the growth rates are very, very high and uh, there's constant disruption uh, whether political disruption or just economic disruption, you know, given uh, labor wage growth and, and all these other things that uh, some of the more advanced economies uh, don't have to necessarily deal with at such a rapid pace. So uh, I, I would suggest that in emerging economies, right, uh, uh, all suppliers are working under, you know, with the high competition already under the margin pressures. So mm -hmm. these times, you know, forces us to operate uh, with the very thin overheads. So I strongly believe that it takes the best of an organization during these times. And when the things resume to normal, maybe it will be a new normal for tomorrow because we may not be able to come back to the same old times, but we have, we will, by that time we would have figured out our new ways of working, which are much more leaner, efficient, and you know, with the, with the least investment into our overheads. Thank you, Gurpreet. Thank you for being a partner of SAP uh, in your procurement transformation. And we wish you the best of success as you proceed in this journey. Thanks, for Our pleasure is all mine. Yeah. And it's with stories like the ones that Gurpreet just shared and the overall discussion that we were talking about earlier that we look to design some of our strategy with the product. So let's talk about the product strategy and what are some of the things that we're looking at doing in the, in the mid to long term and what you can look to benefit from as part of the partnership you have with SAP. 
you know, first of all, let's just talk about the intelligent enterprise in general. Let me define what I think it means to me and what it should mean as it informs the procurement strategy moving forward. First of all, I think the intelligent enterprise means that you have real-time instant access to all of the data about your organization at your fingertips. And you have that access so that you can make active, quick decision support. This is not just data about transactions, but it's also data about experiences, something that's very important about how any company should end up making its decisions. And the second thing is that it should not only provide you this data, but by doing so and by providing you with that decision support, put you as a company in a position where you can actually pivot quickly, pivot at a time of uncertainty, have the flexibility. Flexibility is so, so powerful in today's dynamic world. And any intelligent enterprise needs to be one that can drive and, and, and lead with that flexibility, not be tied to a certain type of way it does something. And it's, it's sort, those are the two sort of guiding principles that I have when I look at how I should inform the procurement product and the procurement strategy moving forward. And when we look at that, there's four key elements that I keep in mind, right? And this is sort of part of the, the change in trends that I'm seeing in procurement. One is I'm seeing the everyday category management change to something more of what we're calling demand orchestration, right? Don't worry about the mechanics of how something is happening, running a tender, the, the processing of a purchase order. Define your goals. Define the goals, the values that you want to get out of the application uh, and your investment. Define them in the system and then monitor real time. Let the product do the work. Speaking of the idea of automation, we're setting up the product to do the work and you're going to monitor the results of the activity and the work. Secondly, and in line with that, and somewhat similar to what I was saying with what the obligations of procurement are moving forward, supplier management as a concept is going to become much broader. Supplier management is going to become the means by which we're going to get innovation partners, partners that will help our companies become more and more productive as we move into an ever more demanding and dynamic world. The third thing is that the idea of the, the demand and supply of hyper-specialization is going to meet. Yeah, so, you know, this is often referred to as the gig economy in, in, in some of the trends that exist in procurement right now. But the idea of, you know, finding the specialized skill, right, and finding it quickly and making sure you fulfill the need is going to become a transformation of the traditional services procurement. And that's so, so very important. Uh, in, in coming out of this pandemic where we know that companies will obviously be hesitant to just, you know, go out and do full-time hiring immediately. And then the last sort of idea is that idea of procurement with purpose. Uh, and when I say that, I don't think it's going to become a footnote anymore, which I think is to some extent, we've seen the change happening, but it's still been a little bit of an afterthought. I think it's going to be ingrained in the idea of procurement processes. So when we talk about doing businesses with local communities and local suppliers, we talk about having an understanding of what your carbon footprint is as you make all of your purchases in real time so you can make decisions based on that. If we talk about supporting social enterprises, all that is going to become ingrained in line with the product. Um, and, and, you know, this is not something that's just a matter of convenience. Consumers want this. Surveys are clear. Your employees want this. The ideas are clear. Um, and I think all these four elements need to um, be a part of any a procurement application they need to facilitate these goals as we move forward and our promise is that sap is going to be that partner that does that for you so all of you again thank you for your time thank you for joining me and have a wonderful day and please keep safe Vice President of Global Marketing for SAP Procurement Solutions. Today's world of constant change, whether from changes in customer demand, supply chain fluctuation, changes in cross-border trade, or in the access and ability to find new talent, companies must constantly rethink and reimagine the future to anticipate what tomorrow, and more importantly, the day after tomorrow looks like. We're thrilled to welcome author, entrepreneur, and radical innovation thought leader and expert, Peter Hinson. 
Peter, can you help us put in a mind frame of reference for how companies need to prepare for the day after tomorrow? Well, thank you, Gretchen, for um, in that introduction. And thanks for allowing me to talk about what I call the never normal. I wrote a book a few years ago, um, which was called uh, Digital is the New Normal. And I think this is exactly what we've experienced in the last couple of years. The last decade was really all about that. What happens in a world where digital basically is the new normal and became our only option? I'm an electronics engineer, but in my house, my appreciation as a dad, for example, is completely correlated to the quality of the Wi-Fi signal in our house. If the Wi-Fi is good, then I'm okay as dad. And there was a, if there's a tiny interruption, which gives like a millisecond of a hiccup in their YouTube or TikTok, they openly question the fact if I ever got a degree in computer science. That is really that idea of digital becoming the new normal. But it's gone beyond that. It's not the fact that it's just normal. It has started to shift and change things. We've been talking about digital disruption very intensely. We've seen that technology has an enormous potential to really impact economic behavior. And in some markets, like for example, retail, we've seen that very, very clearly establish itself. But it's now progressing. We've seen that technology has an impact on politics. It has an impact on geopolitics. You can basically say that in the last decade, we've seen that gradually digital technology started to have a bigger and bigger impact societally. And when you talk about this, this is going beyond just the fact that it's normal. For the last 10 years, people have always asked me after I wrote the book, well, what's the next new normal? And I tried for a while to find the new, new normal, and I gave up because I think we now have something which I call the new normals plural. I, I couldn't fit it into one word anymore. If you look at 2020, you could, from a consumer point of view, say that, for example, social has become the new normal. My 21-year-old daughter still uses Facebook Messenger. My 16-year-old boy thinks that Facebook Messenger is from the days of the dinosaurs. And they were both introduced into TikTok by their 11-year-old niece. But this is clearly the new normal. Multi-channel, omni-channel is the new normal. Everything powered by big data is the new normal. Mobile is the new normal. These are all consumer-oriented, but also in the enterprise environment. Cloud computing has become the new normal. The way of developing in an agile way that we borrowed from the startups is the new normal. And especially the idea of platforms and network operations connected with APIs has become the new normal. And I think what is happening now is that it's actually the combination of things. It's the cocktail of new things that are constantly accelerating the pace of change. Just look at platforms combined with data with artificial intelligence and with automation, that is propelling us into what I call the day after tomorrow. And this is a very, very simple concept. It's a very simple model, and it basically allows you to think, how much time are we spending in our company on today, on tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow? Today is the hundreds of emails to get every day or the dozens of Zoom calls you're in. Tomorrow was next year's budget. And of course, I feel sorry for everyone who put so much effort into you know, the budget of 2020 last November, and by March, we threw it into the bin. And then there's the day after tomorrow, new ideas, new concepts, new technologies that change the rules of the game. How much time are we spending on that? And some people say 70, 20, 10, reality is often 93, seven and zero, and the problem is value. Today is very important, tomorrow even more, but the day after tomorrow, which is hurtling towards us, becomes crucial if you want to reinvent yourself. Now, that's not complete. There's also the mess of the past that we have to clean up. And what is your balance in a world of thinking about the day after tomorrow and basically cleaning up the mess of the legacies? We're now experiencing a very strange environment. This is the year the earth stood still. It was the biggest digital stress test and we're beginning to see what is BC before Corona and what is after Corona. And I think one thing is clear, we're not going back to any type of old normal. What we had in the past is probably not going to be what happens once this is over. We probably have to prepare for constant change. I see a number of seismic shocks. I mean, there are, of course, the technological seismic shocks. The last decade was all about digital. 
But look at artificial intelligence. I mean, we haven't even started to scratch the surface. So we're going to see a number of these technological seismic shocks in the next decade or decades. We're now in the midst of one of the biggest biological seismic shocks. But what about ecological? What if the sea levels would rise by one meter? Or geopolitical seismic shocks? Look at the rising tensions between the US and China. So what these shocks actually do is they introduce shifts, systemic shifts into, for example, consumer behavior. The last decade when digital became normal was all about what happens once the relationship with the customer becomes a digital relationship and that changed consumer behavior. But it's not just consumers. Business models are shifting. We see that capacity and resource planning, network operations, financial dynamics, they're all constantly shifting as a result of these disruptions. So maybe what we have to do is think about this constant change as the new normal. Maybe this is the new business as usual. And this is what I label as the never normal. A world of constant change that we have to get used to, that we actually have to figure out how to thrive in these never normal environments. And in the last couple of years, it was very fashionable to talk about something called VUCA. Uh, this is a four-letter acronym talking about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. But I didn't really like the VUCA environment because it, there was no answer to that. But what we're experiencing now in this never normal is that we have to figure out how to actually get stronger. And this is where we reintroduce the concept of anti-fragile. Nassim Taleb wrote that book um, in 2008 after the big financial crisis. And he talked about the fact that some companies didn't survive. Lehman Brothers just couldn't handle the stress of the system and basically broke. But as a result of the financial crisis, you saw some of the banks putting all sorts of mechanisms and governance to become more robust. And that really happened. But the problem is they lost their agility. And Asim Taleb talked about this idea of resilience or anti-fragile. How can you actually become stronger as a result of fundamental stress to the system. And we're now seeing that in the never normal episode that we experienced in 2020, some companies have really shown that. Walmart is one of my favorite examples. Walmart is a company that was fighting against Amazon, but they were prepared. They were dealing with their day after tomorrow. They could reinvent themselves and actually come out stronger out of this crisis. The CEO of Walmart, Doug McMillan said, Usually supply chains operate really quietly behind the scenes, but this pandemic has shown that the supply chain is actually a lifeline. And I believe that those companies who have figured out how to put the agility into their processes, how to take a supply chain and put that into a lifeline, are those companies who were prepared for the day after tomorrow. But let me be clear, there is no playbook for the never normal. This is not about lessons learned. This is about lessons learning. How can we continuously adapt and learn from the environment? And it's not all technology. It's not all data. Um, Chris Anderson, the editor of Wired Magazine, wrote a very interesting article in 2008 called The End of Theory. And he said, with all this data, why don't we use that to actually figure out what the future is? but no data or algorithm could have foreseen COVID-19. It took the ingenuity and creativity of humans together with technology to really put innovation into practice. This is the never normal where nobody stays in their lane. And it's not just technology or operations, it's really all about people. How can we reinvent the possibility to really engage people in this never normal environment? Skills are changing at a rapid pace. But it's also the mindset and the heart set. How do you capture the engagement of people to actually function in this never normal environment? And my God, what a stress test that has been. Where we work, work from home, is probably going to fundamentally be altered. But it's not just the location. How do we trust people? How do we engage people? What type of new skills do we need to learn them? And how can we put the empathy and the human factor back into this? I think the never normal is a really good opportunity to think about face changes. Just like you, know, you have ice turning into water and liquid turning into vapor, can we actually use this never normal as a way to really fundamentally introduce a step change in what we do? 
This is going to require leadership in organizations, fundamentally rethinking the individual and the collective, but this is an opportunity, in my opinion, to turn this all the way to 11. The never normal, in my opinion, is an excellent example to really step up our game and to fundamentally think about a world where the day after tomorrow becomes a very practical reality. Mm. Peter, it's so interesting to hear some of your perspective on the challenges that companies face, whether it's operational, supply and demand, um, procurement, certainly workforce. When you think about companies who are really well primed to deal with the never, never normal, to be in a scenario where they can um, take on a crisis and emerge stronger, can you give us some examples of some companies that you may have seen who are, are well primed to do that? Well, I think what is interesting is that what we've seen, of course, in the last couple of um, weeks is that a lot of the technology companies um, have been very resilient. I mean, I think the tech has kind of come out stronger as a result of this. That was to be expected. Not all of them. Of course, companies like Uber and Airbnb are suffering because you know, their reality just isn't there anymore. But I think I'm more interested in those traditional companies capable of reinventing themselves. I've seen amazing companies take advantage of this to really accelerate or maybe even hyper accelerate what they do in terms of transformation. The most important characteristics of those companies is that you need to really get that sense of urgency right and not just see it as survival mode, but as an opportunity to really step up some of these game changing and these phase changes. Experiment, try, even fail, but learn from those mistakes. And that type of leadership mentality and culture might be even more important than just the technological side of things. Mm. And what about for organizations that may feel that they're a step behind? Any advice or recommendation for them? Well, I think it's pretty clear that those companies who had the time to prepare um, have come out stronger. But I think those companies who are a little bit behind, I would say, take advantage of this. Never waste a good crisis. I think some of them might be in survival mode, but I think this is a great opportunity to take some of these elements and to maybe create an opportunity to really step up. I think uh, a crisis might be an excellent opportunity to step aside from your normal mode of operation and really focus on thinking about what that next step in the never normal would be. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, a lot of people are certainly finding this constant change unnerving, right? But I think as you've just described, you know, there is opportunity to be found as well in this constant shift. What would you see as some of those opportunities for organizations? Well, I understand that it's unnerving. It's going to be unnerving for a lot of people because if you want to use the old mechanisms of governance to think about this, you can't. And I think the fundamental problem there is that maybe we weren't prepared. I got into an argument recently with London Business School, which is you know, where I spend most of my time, saying, why do we still teach an MBA? Because an MBA basically is preparing people for the 20th century but that doesn't exist anymore. The 20th century was all about scale and perfection and execution and Six Sigma, and, but we're now seeing that the world of volatility and change and disruption, this never normal, we need new skills to deal with that. I would say this is not just about investing in technology, which is a big part. It's about a different mindset and culture, but it's also about a different approach to leadership. And I think we're going to have to prepare the next generation of managers and leaders to deal with this constant change, to feel comfortable with that, and to see that as gigantic opportunities to really transform faster than before. But I think this is going to be even more important than just putting the right tools or the right platforms in place. And so that's that's interesting to think about, you know, what's needed from a leadership perspective in order to anticipate how to truly support the work, the, the future workforce, right? What do we need to do today in order to enable the workforce of the future to be prepared? When you think about, um, you know, consumer expectations and the workforce of the future, are there certain industries that you think are better prepared or are more able to adapt? Well, I think um, the idea of more flexibility in how we think about skills and labor is going to be essential. 
we're going to have to constantly think about what type of capacity and resources do we need? What are the skills necessary to really make the difference? And this is going to be much more volatile, much more flexible, much more agile than we've ever had in the past. That type of flexibility, that network thinking almost inside the idea of labor, I think that is going to be crucial. How do we organize for a world of fluid labor? How do we make sure that this is fair for everybody involved, both in the short term and the long term? And I think this is going to be one of the most important things that also governments have to chip in and figure out how to really address that issue. Fantastic. Peter, thank you so much for, for a fascinating discussion. We truly appreciate the opportunity to hear your perspectives on the never normal and your recommendations on how organizations can prepare. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good work, Gretchen. I'd like to thank today's guests for sharing how they're collaborating and innovating during this time of change while reimagining the future. Whether it's sourcing and shipping hospital equipment within hours, finding frontline workers within days, rethinking decades old processes, or imagining the possibilities of what procurement will look like tomorrow. We hope you feel more inspired than ever to create the stability, responsiveness, and resiliency that will keep business moving forward. There's so much more to share, so please visit ariba.com and fieldglass.com to learn more about these customers and what's next for procurement. Thank you for joining us today. I encourage you to check back for more stories in the coming weeks. Woo!